Okay. Welcome back. Um, so we're going to continue on where we left off in the previous class, uh, talking about uh, the three domain tree of life. Uh, and uh, I'm just going to back up again and just quickly cover this again. So what Woes did um, was crack open the cells of different organisms, Isolate the ribosomes. Oh, these are keys. <laughs> yeah. Um, read the string of letters inside the ribosomal RNA that was isolated from these ribosomes. Made a big data matrix. Built an evolutionary tree from that data matrix and found three main groups in the tree. Um, and he named this new group this um, that were prokaryotic cells, that is, the cells did not have a nucleus. He named them Archaebacteria, and he chose that name. Um, I think he regretted this later, uh, first of all, because they're not bacteria. So bacteria, including bacteria in the name, was probably uh, not the best idea in the world. So they were renamed the Archaea. Uh, sorry, I just thought there was uh, another slide there. They were renamed the Archaea later on, um, and the Archae part of their name comes from the fact that when he did this original study, the organisms that grouped in this new third branch in the Tree of Life lived in really extreme environments that he thought were reflective of um, some relic from the ancient earth, which the term for the ancient earth was the Archean earth. And so he named them the Archaebacteria and then eventually the Archaea because of this um, fact that many of them were found in these extreme environments. Subsequently, there are many bacteria that have been found in extreme environments, and we'll talk about that in other lectures, and there are Archaea that are found in non-extreme environments. Um, but anyway, so he built this tree, it was an unrooted tree. Uh, since we didn't um, go into a lot of detail uh, at all about unrooted trees, um, you can also view this as a tree with a polytomy here. And we don't know the order of branching among these um, major groups in the tree of life. That's what this polytomy reflects. And again, um, the the organisms in this archaea group were found in these sort of boiling hot springs or um, extremely salty environments. And uh, we'll talk about them later in the next couple of weeks when we start to talk about the features of different um, microorganisms. Uh, you don't have to know all the details in this table. This is just here to remind me um, and to point out that when Woos made this discovery, people rethought a lot of what they had been observing and then started to make more observations about um, different features present in bacteria versus archaea versus eukaryotes and started to find that in fact there were many features that appeared to be unique to one of these three domains in the tree of life. And so just having this proposal that there was a third branch in the tree um, made people, in essence, relook at the archaea in particular and start to study their biology in more detail. And many very interesting things came out of those studies. We'll talk about that again more um, uh, in the next couple of weeks. Um, but we're going to do a clicker question first. So if So considering this um, tree, uh, three domain tree, how many distinct ways uh, are there to resolve this polytomy that's shown in this tree? Uh, 
give you until 1.30. Everyone answering? Anybody need another second here? All right, I'll stop. All right, 62% said B. Um, those 62% are correct. Uh, okay, so this, um, this polytomy is um, equivalent to the polytomy I talked about earlier with humans, chimps, and gorillas, uh, and so if we look at, treat each of these from this node, I'll go back here, from this node here, we can resolve the order of branching of these three branches. One resolution is with bacteria and archaea as sister taxa. Uh, a second is with bacteria and eukaryotes as sister taxa. And a third is archaea and eukaryotes as sister taxa. So these are the three ways to resolve that polytomy um, of the three domains in the tree of life. So again, that's sort of the equivalent here. We had three different ways to resolve this polytomy with humans, chimps, and gorilla. Now, um, if you wanted to figure out which of those branching orders is the best. Um, we want to build a phylogenetic tree, and let's say we're using parsimony um, reconstruction method. Uh, it would be very helpful in doing that resolution if we had an outgroup, just like we did with orangutan, and that outgroup allowed us to determine the ancestral and derived character states based upon the state in the outgroup. Um, and so, what is the outgroup for the three domain tree of life? That this is all organisms on the planet. So, the outgroup is either life somewhere else, um, we don't have data on that, or it's really nothing. That is, what an outgroup is, is a branch, a lineage that's separated from the common ancestor of all other taxa in the in-group, of the, of the common ancestor of the in-group taxa, prior to the existence of that common ancestor. So it's a branch, if we drew a tree of life like this, it's some lineage that's separated out um, on the branch leading up to the common ancestor of bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes. Now it's entirely possible that this happened. Remember when I was talking about uh, oversimplifications in trees, um, there are many extinct lineages of, you know, every type of organism. There very well might have been many other branches in the tree of life. We don't have any information about them. They may even be hidden out there somewhere. But if we don't have information about them, we can't use this um, strategy that we used for the human chimp gorilla polytomy to root um, the tree of life and determine the branching order of these three domains. And so what I'm going to talk about for a few minutes here is an alternative approach, a very creative, somewhat complicated approach to figuring out what to use as an outgroup for all of life and not using any taxon as the outgroup, but using a really interesting trick. And I'm going to first take you through sort of a, a conceptual model of evolution of organisms before we talk about this trick that was used, not trick, this incredibly creative method that was used to figure out the branching order among bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes. And so imagine um, each of these taxa has hundreds to thousands to tens of thousands of genes inside their genome. And what I'm going to do to represent that is uh, draw this big, thick bar to represent the evolutionary lineage of the whole cell. And then what we're going to do is draw the evolution of individual genes 
inside the genomes of these organisms and show how those genes track with the evolution of species. So imagine in the common ancestor, in the lineage leading up to the common ancestor of, of bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes, um, there's a population, a species here, it had lots of genes, here's one gene. When uh, the common ancestor separated into two distinct lineages and then eventually um, whatever happened at this polytomy, the descendants of that inherited um, this gene. So we're going to draw for now a polytomy for that gene too inside the genome of these lineages. Here's another gene, it's going to follow the same pattern, if you know, nothing unusual is happening all genes should follow the same pattern as each other and should, you know, follow the evolution of the, the species here. And that doesn't really help us yet, so, but it's just to show you this idea of drawing gene trees inside what's called the species tree or the genome tree. And what a few scientists realized in the 1980s was um, a really interesting thing, event had occurred early in the evolution of life, prior to the existence of the common ancestor of bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes. And what had occurred was there was a single gene that encoded a part of the translation apparatus called an elongation factor. And this elongation factor um, was part, you know, interacted with the translation machinery. And if you look at modern organisms, something very interesting is seen, which is that all bacteria, all archaea, all eukaryotes have multiple versions of elongation factors. And those versions are related to each other. So bacteria have, let's just call it for now, elongation factor A and elongation factor B. And elongation factor A and elongation factor B are separate proteins encoded by genes in the genomes of the, these bacteria. And if you compare them to each other, they're pretty similar in their three-dimensional structure, they're pretty similar in the string of amino acids that code for them. They are derived from a common ancestral elongation factor sometime in the past. And if you look at archaea, they have multiple elongation factors that also share common ancestry. And they have, you know, multiple versions of this. And eukaryotes also have multiple versions. And it turns out that bacteria have a version that was originally called the elongation factor G. Doesn't matter why. Archaea have an elongation factor that is more like the bacterial elongation factor G than it is like the other elongation factors inside archaea. And eukaryotes have an elongation factor G that is more like the archaeal and bacterial elongation factor G than it is like the other elongation factor inside eukaryotes. That is, there are two distinct forms of elongation factors. Um, and then this second elongation factor, elongation factor two, um, bacteria have a version of this, archaea have a version of this, and eukaryotes have a version of this. And these are basically um, two sets of elongation factors that are more closely related to each other across species than they are to the other versions of elongation factors inside the genomes of these organisms. And the model, the best model that's been presented to explain this is that a long time in the past there was this ancestral elongation factor, and prior to the existence of the common ancestor of bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes, but in the lineage leading up to that common ancestor, there was a duplication of this gene. So inside the genome, a second copy of this gene got made. When this first happened, they were identical to each other. But over time, those two different versions of that ancestral elongation factor started to become different from each other by divergence. It's not divergence between species now, it's divergence within an individual species of these different forms. So we had this duplication event, and again, in the lineage leading up to the common ancestor of bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes. And if we draw that an evolutionary tree of elongation factor genes inside the black bar of the species tree, 
that tree is going to look like this, where there was a split event. And this node represents the common ancestry of two different forms of elongation factor G and their duplication event. And then as speciation events happened, as new lineages evolved, each of the descendants inherited each version of this elongation factor. Until today, we have elongation factor G in bacteria represented by this blue branch. And if you trace the evolution of elongation factor G, it's more closely related to elongation factor Gs in other bacteria than it is. You have to go all the way back to the duplication event to see where it shares a common ancestry with elongation factor two. There's a special term for this. We'll come back to this later in the course. Um, these genes that are related by duplication events are called paralogs. It's like homolog because they evolve in parallel within a species. We don't need to worry about the terminology right now. We'll come back to defining that later. But what the scientists who observed this realized was that they could build an evolutionary tree of elongation factor G. That tree should reflect the evolution of the species in which elongation factor G is found. And now they have an outgroup. It's not another taxon, but it's elongation factor two is branched off in evolutionary history prior to the existence of the common ancestor of all the elongation factor Gs. Fits the exact definition of an outgroup. It's just now a gene duplication event rather than an evolutionary origin of a new species, a new lineage. And so when they built evolutionary trees, so you can take elongation factors, the genes for them, or the proteins that are encoded by those genes, make a data matrix, you have an in-group, which is all the versions of, let's say, elongation factor G. You can use the elongation factor twos as your outgroup to determine the ancestral character states like we did in the parsimony method. And when you do that, when they did that, the best tree was the one with archaea and eukaryotes as sister taxa. A bit surprising to many people uh, at the time, um, largely because uh, archaea, you know, again, look more like bacteria than they do like eukaryotes. So I, I, I know that this sort of thinking about genes evolving within a species is, uh, can be a little complicated, but it, the principle here is the same principle that we applied when we talked about outgroups. It's just now a gene event inside a species rather than a species branch in the tree. Yeah, question. So, so what happened was there was a species that was the, com the common ancestor of bacteria and in fact, Prior to that, there was a lineage, the root branch, leading up to the common ancestor of bacteria and And at one time, that organism had just one elongation factor. And that helped it carry out translation of proteins. And inside that population, there's a big genome with thousands of genes. The piece of DNA that maybe is 5,000 bases of DNA that's coded for that old elongation, that original elongation factor, got copied to another region of the genome. And now there were two identical copies of that original gene inside the genome. Does that so far make sense? At, at, the, at the origin of this event, this was uh, three billion years ago, or four billion years ago, at the beginning, they were identical to each other. There was no elongation factor G in two yet. It was just elongation factor. And then over time, that species, that population, evolved different functions, slightly different functions for these two different genes. And they began to accumulate sequence differences from each other. Even though they were different parts of the genome within an individual species, now they become different from each other within that organism's genome. Does that make sense? And that's, at some point, they acquired enough differences that we would call them elongation factor G and elongation factor two. And then 
that's still in the branch leading up to the common ancestor. No, there hasn't been a separation of archaea, bacteria, and eukaryotic lineages yet. When that separation happens, each of the descendants now inherit elongation factor G and elongation factor 2 in their genomes. And so because this event, that duplication event, and the origin of these differences between the two elongation factors happened prior to the existence of the common ancestor of bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes, it, it serves as an outgroup. So when we build a tree of elongation factor Gs, we can use elongation factor 2, any of them, as the outgroup for that tree, and vice versa. That. Any other? Okay, so there's a slight wrinkle. We'll talk about this a little bit more. Um, so this uh, rooted tree of life with archaea and eukaryotes as the sister taxa is supported by some of the data, some of the time. Um, so we'll come back to this uh, later in class, but um, one thing I wanted to bring up uh, right now is that there is um, a bit of a debate going on in the scientific community right now between, in particular, a tree that looks like this for the evolutionary history of these three um, lineages and potentially a tree that looks like this, where, um, in essence, eukaryotes evolve from within what we call archaea right now, rather than archaea being a separate monophyletic group. And I'll come back to this a few times in the rest of this lecture and later on. There is ambiguity. You're trying to infer events that happened three or so billion years ago from data from modern organisms. It's, it's very uh, uh, difficult to do that. But the book, um, and for many of the discussions that we're going to have in class, we're going to still treat this tree um, as the winner in part, I'm doing that because that's been the commonly accepted tree. It's also the tree that they use in the book, so I don't want to create too many differences from the book. And um, right now, it's unclear exactly which of these trees is best. We're going to stick to this one, at least for now. Okay, so what we're going to do now um, is take this particular rooted tree of life with archaea and eukaryotes as sister taxa and bacteria on their own branch and look at how that impacts our thinking about the evolutionary ancestry of features that are present in um, modern organisms and also what we can infer about the properties of the last universal common ancestor of all taxa. That is, what was the um, ancestral, what were the ancestral states for particular features? So we're going to do um, another clicker question here. Uh, given this particular rooted tree, um, prokaryotes can be described as um, paraphyletic, monophyletic, quasi-phyletic, or multi-phyletic. All right, I'm going to give you until 1.15. Everyone ready? Come on, come on. All right. All right, 90% of you got it correct. Good job. Um, so this goes back to the definition that I gave before of uh, the different types of phyle, monophyle, paraphyle, 
Um, I didn't define the other two because I made them up last night at 2 in the morning. Um, uh, but the point of this question is really to discuss this, um, this issue, which is that um, if this rooted tree is correct with archaea and eukaryotes as sister taxa, it means that the old division that had existed between prokaryotes and eukaryotes that some people had used to say that they were two separate branches on the tree is not an evolutionary uh, sort of consistent argument. That is that archaea, even though they don't have a nucleus, that's not reflective that they share a common ancestry with bacteria to the exclusion of eukaryotes. It's just, um, uh, it, it's a misleading piece of information in terms of phylogenetic reconstruction. So what I'm going to do now is take this uh, rooted tree and walk through some evolutionary reconstructions of different features of taxa. Um, here's an example of one. I, I'm, Student pointed this out earlier. I'm pretty sure that these are backwards, that this, this is ether and that is ester, but um, I'm going to embarrass myself with my horrible chemistry. And my mom's a chemist. She would shoot me. Um, uh, so um, if we look at the membranes of cells, when archaea were first discovered, people pointed out, oh, that's really interesting. Um, many, most, a lot of the archaea have these um, alternative membrane structure compared to bacteria and eukaryotes. And so if we take that alternative, this um, ether linkage in their membranes and ask what is that, what is the likely ancestry of this? The most parsimonious explanation is that there was uh, evolutionary change on the branch leading up to the common ancestry, ancestor of archaea and um, that the ancestral state was the state that we see in bacteria and eukaryotes. Um, we can do the same uh, general thing with features that are conserved across bacteria. I'm just giving sort of examples of each of these. We'll talk about more when we talk about the diversity of microbes in the next few lectures, some other features. Here's one that is um, a hallmark of bacteria. It's this compound called peptidoglycan, which is used in the cell walls of bacteria. So um, the surrounding of the cell of bacteria has some really interesting properties. We will talk more about this later in the class. Uh, all bacteria are surrounded by a combination of membranes and this material peptidoglycan, which makes up what's called the cell wall. There actually are two major different versions of the surrounding of cells. Some that are called gram-positive, we'll come back to this again later have a membrane and then a pep thick peptidoglycan layer. Those that are called gram-negative have a membrane, a layer of peptidoglycan, and then another membrane. But peptidoglycan is um, found across the bacteria and not in archaea or eukaryotes. So, you know, again, here's the peptidoglycan and the absence of peptidoglycan. So if we take that, um, here's uh, another clicker question. So based upon um, this tree, using parsimony reconstruction, what can you infer about the ancestral character state related to peptidoglycan? I'll give you until 1.30. Ready? 
seconds. All right. Um, the majority answered C. That is correct. Um, and you, you can't tell here because the, the two alternatives are equally parsimonious. They only require one change. And that's because um, you can have the event occurring on the branch leading up to the common ancestor of bacteria or an alternative event. I don't know how to keep this out of the way here. Um, so you could have had peptidoglycan in the common ancestor of everything and then it'd be lost in the lineage leading up to archaea and eukaryotes. Or it could have been absent from the common ancestor and gained in the lineage leading up to um, bacteria. And so um, this exercise, and I'll show you one more version of this exercise of looking at the evolutionary history here, is both important for understanding the general biology of some of these lineages, but it's also important for many people who study early events in the evolution of life. So there are a lot of people that are looking through um, rocks and uh, looking for fossils of different organisms, and if we have a good model as to what the properties were of the common ancestor of bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes. That can guide both what you look for and the interpretation of some of the studies that you're doing with looking for fossil record for early life or chemical relics of early life. And it's also really important for people who study the origin of life. So when you um, study the origin of life, what you're basically, many people are trying to do is connect um, early events in the Earth history or recreations, theoretical or experimental, of early events in Earth history with um, as early as possible information that we have about living systems. And so the better we understand what the features were in the most recent common ancestor and even in the branch leading up to the most recent common ancestor, that guides both those experiments and the interpretation of those experiments. So it um, may seem like an esoteric exercise, but it turns out to be very useful to do these things for various uh, geological and uh, chemical evolution studies. So um, we're now going to turn to where there's much more uh, going on in terms of features. And these are the features that are unique to eukaryotes, um, but not seen or seen in a different form in bacteria and archaea. The hallmark one of these that led to the definition of eukaryotes is the nucleus. Um, the nucleus is this uh, membrane that surrounds the DNA inside eukaryotic cells. It is used for compartmentalization. There are many, um, there are pores inside this membrane and proteins that stick through the membrane and uh, when DNA is transcribed into RNA, the RNA then has to get exported out of the nucleus. For genes that interact with DNA, they have to, proteins that interact with DNA, they have to be made in the cytoplasm where the ribosomes are and then get back into the nucleus to interact with DNA. That's very different than what goes on in bacteria and archaea where the DNA, it's not completely free floating around in the cell, but there's no membrane partitioning of the DNA from the rest of the goings-on inside of the cell. So this nucleus has got a lot of important uh, functions for eukaryotes, and if we look at the evolutionary history of the nucleus using sort of, again, the same tree, uh, here's the nucleus, absence of nucleus, and if we do the most parsimonious explanation is that the nucleus arose in the branch leading up to the common ancestor of eukaryotes. So after archaea separated as, their, as a separate branch in the tree of life. Now it turns out um, a ton of interesting biological features were either invented on this branch or changed in some way on this branch leading up to the common ancestor of eukaryotes such that many aspects of cellular and molecular functions are distinct in eukaryotes compared to what you see in bacteria and archaea. Now there are universal homologies, there are features that everything shares in common, but there are also a lot of features that are um, unique in the eukaryotic branch. So the fact that there's a nucleus allows eukaryotes to do interesting things related to processing RNA. So when DNA is transcribed into RNA, 
in bacteria and archaea, that RNA is now in immediately, well, not immediately, but is bound up by ribosomes if it's coding for proteins, and those ribosomes can translate the RNA into proteins immediately. That's called coupled transcription and translation. And in eukaryotes, RNA is first made in the nucleus, and then it has to be exported out of the nucleus to the cytoplasm where the ribosomes are in order for the protein coding RNAs in order for it to be translated into proteins. And that's called uncoupled transcription and translation. And that decoupling allows eukaryotes to do a variety of interesting things to their RNA. So for example, many protein coding genes in eukaryotes, if you look at the DNA that codes for a protein coding gene in eukaryotes, um, what you see is that if you align the DNA for that gene with the final RNA that's made into proteins, there are many pieces of the DNA that never make it into the final RNA. These are called introns. The parts that make it into the final protein are called exons. And what happens is a, a process called splicing where you first make a full length RNA that corresponds to the whole region that includes the introns and exons and then the introns are removed by this process of splicing. And it turns out that they're not always removed in the same way. So you can have one gene that encodes um, proteins, but by differentially selecting the exons from that gene and splicing them together in different ways, a eukaryote can make hundreds to thousands to millions of different proteins from the same gene a feature that's very different from what goes on in bacteria and archaea, and is in essence allowed by this decoupling of transcription and translation that gives you time and spatial separation to carry out this splicing process. When um, eukaryotic cells uh, asexually reproduce, um, there's a process you should be familiar with called mitosis, that is how the chromosomes get segregated and how the cell division occurs. Um, when uh, eukaryotic cells undergo sexual reproduction or the production of gametes, that's done through a specialized process called meiosis. Both of these are, the mechanisms are unique to um, eukaryotes. We don't see things that are the equivalent to meiosis or really the exact mechanism of mitosis in bacteria and archaea. Um, eukaryotes on average compared to bacteria and archaea have um, what are called linear chromosomes. The DNA that's in the nucleus is a long string that has two ends uh, at the end of the DNA. In bacteria and archaea, many of the chromosomes are a circular piece of DNA. At the ends of the chromosomes, it turns out that it's difficult to make copies of the ends of chromosomes, and eukaryotes have specialized processes to do this. Uh, one of those processes is something called telomeres, so uh, these are examples you should familiarize yourself with, you know, the major features of eukaryotic cells versus bacterial and archaeal cells. Uh, we will be talking about this a lot on and off in the next few weeks. Um, bacteria and archaea can undergo asexual reproduction, but the mechanism by which they copy themselves is very distinct from the mitosis process in eukaryotes. Um, bacteria and archaea can exchange DNA with each other, We'll talk about this a little more in the next lecture, but they don't have sexual reproduction in the true sense that we see it in eukaryotes, but they do have many means by which DNA can be passed from one cell to another cell. Uh, this is an example of what's generally called bacterial mating, where a plasmid can get transferred by a little um, conjugation to, to another cell. A plasmid is a small piece of DNA that can get transferred between cells. Anyway, Lots of interesting events happened in the branch leading up to the common ancestor of eukaryotes. Um, so what I want to do for the next you know, remaining 10 minutes is talk about um, a model uh, to explain what happened here. Um, I've rearranged the order that in the slides that I posted, I'm going to come back to viruses at the end of uh, today and talk about um, this sort of complications in the tree of life that relate to eukaryotic evolution first. So I'm going to do this um, a little bit out of the historical model for how this was discovered, but just take you through sort of the logic first. So when Carl Woese built the tree of life that we looked at, and when 
Those other scientists, uh, Gogarten, Awabi, I didn't mention their names, but they built this rooted tree that showed archaea and eukaryotes as sister taxa. Um, they didn't sample a lot of the genome of any of these organisms. Um, if you look at a eukaryotic chromosome, we have 23 chromosomes, other eukaryotes have more. The chromosomes, when they're not being actively used, are sort of packaged away in these um, bundles of DNA. When the DNA is actively used, it gets opened up, and a region of the DNA gets transcribed and eventually translated. And if you zoom in on just one little region of this giant coil of DNA that might be 20 million base pairs long, for example, you find a gene encoding the ribosomal RNA. And so what Wose was looking at was he isolated the RNA from cells. That RNA was encoded by this a gene that represented a tiny fraction of the total genome of any particular organism. And he built evolutionary trees of the ribosome RNA. It was one of the few things um, that you could compare across all taxa, uh, and still one of the few things that's sort of present, one of these universal homologies. And then the elongation factor researchers took another region of the genome. They looked at the DNA encoding, the proteins, these different elongation factors, and they built trees. And for many of the pieces of the genome, when you look at them now, you do see a pattern that is like this, with archaea and eukaryotes as sister taxa, and bacteria as the, the, the lone out, outgroup relative to the two of them. For many, but not for all. And for a large fraction of the genome of eukaryotes, you see a very interesting pattern, which is that the eukaryotes show up in a branch in the evolutionary tree in the middle of bacteria. All eukaryotes, when you look at these particular genes, are monophyletic compared to each other, but now they've split up bacteria, basically. And there are some bacteria that they are more closely related to than the, those eukaryotes are to archaea. And in fact, these bacteria are more closely related to eukaryotes for these parts of the genome than they are even to other bacteria. It's very strange um, that you have these different evolutionary histories. So again, if you look, a lot of the DNA, a lot of the genes in the genome might follow this pattern, but a decent number of them follow this pattern with eukaryotes inside bacteria. Um, and so what this means is that eukaryotes are what are called a chimera. Um, they have multiple histories inside their cell. Another way of thinking about this is that, in fact, we cannot draw a single bifurcating tree to represent the evolutionary history of organisms. Different parts of the eukaryotic cell have different histories. So there is no simple bifurcating tree of life. We still use uh, that the concept of the tree of life is still used as a term by many people, but really what we should be talking about is the history of life or um, a web of life, as I will show you later, because there are connections between branches where um, parts of the cells have complicated merging histories. And I'm going to show you uh, one example of this. We will talk more about this uh, later in the class, but this relates to uh, something found inside most eukaryotic cells, which is the mitochondrion. It's an organelle that uh, is used to generate ATP um, in, in many uh, eukaryotes. If you look in the microscope, a good microscope, at mitochondria, you will notice probably if you have looked at pictures of bacteria too, that this, you could imagine that this is a bacterium inside a eukaryotic cell. Now, today, this is very familiar to many people, but many years ago, uh, people didn't make this connection. And um, part of the reason for this goes back to Woes, when I talked about Woes building the tree of life, the appearance of microbes is not a very good indicator to their evolutionary history. And so um, the different parts inside of a cell, maybe you would look at them and not make the connection based upon their appearance to say that they look like um, bacteria. But actually, mitochondria have DNA inside of them. You can pull out that DNA and build evolutionary trees of that DNA. And when you do that, 
um, you see that the mitochondria are very clearly derived evolutionarily related to bacteria. And this idea is commonly accepted now, um, but really 40 years ago, maybe a little more than 40 years ago, it was not on too many people's minds um, until a woman named Lynn Margulis uh, proposed a model based upon a lot of microscopy work and then thinking about how cells work. And she proposed this model, um, which I'm going to take you through here, to explain how the mitochondrion could have had come from bacteria. And so the model goes as follows. You had a um, ancestral cell uh, on the branch leading up to the common ancestor of eukaryotes. Maybe this had a nucleus. I'll show this in a minute. Maybe it didn't. But it's, you know, shares a common, let's just say this lineage shares a common ancestry with archaea. Separated from the common ancestor of archaea at some point. And then that cell, that lineage, evolves some type of interaction with a bacterium. A bacterium, a particular type of bacteria called a proteobacteria, which we'll come back to in later lectures. This bacteria had its own cell envelope, cell wall, different cell components. It had its own genome. That bacteria was brought inside the cell in a process much like white blood cells and amoeba and other eukaryotic cells today envelop food particles, a um, process called phagocytosis, brought inside the cell. This bacteria was then living inside the cell of its host. Um, it gets surrounded by the host cell membrane when this process happens. And eventually, over evolutionary time, it started to throw away some of its features until it became what we call today the mitochondrion. And the DNA of the host cell at some point, although it's not exactly clear when, got packaged up and surrounded by a membrane to create what we call the nucleus of today. And so this model, that what we now call the mitochondrion, if we go backwards, it came from an alpha proteobacterium that was brought inside the cell after it had some type of symbiosis with this um, uh, eukaryotic nucleus ancestor here. Um, and so, again, for part of the eukaryotic genome, evolutionary trees look like this. That's sort of the, the DNA of that host cell prior to the symbiosis. And for part of the eukaryotic genome and the eukaryotic cell, the evolutionary tree looks like this, with eukaryotes evolving part of their genome from within bacteria. And what I want to leave you with before you go is this last one little um, issue, concept, complication, which is that the mitochondria of today have very small genomes. They don't encode a lot of genes. But as I said before, many of the genes in the eukaryotic genome can trace their evolutionary ancestry with bacteria, with the mitochondria. Those are genes in the nuclear genome now. Over evolutionary time, DNA moved from the mitochondrial genome into the nuclear genome and is now retained in the nucleus, but encodes functions that happen in the mitochondrion. So this is what creates the chimeric origin of the eukaryotic nucleus. We have DNA streaming from the mitochondria and its ancestors into the nucleus, and eukaryotes have this complicated, cool history. And I will stop there.
He was the most interactive of anybody there at this moment. He was incredible. Just, yeah. Well, so, um, I'm just saving everything here. Yeah, I'll give you a second. And I gotta get out of the way, I guess. No, it's okay. <laughs> 